Uh, welcome to the 2012 Freedom of Expression Forum. Here with us we have Josh Wolf, uh, a documentary filmmaker and freelance journalist. Thank you for your talk, and now I'm just going to ask a few questions. Sounds great. So the first one is, um, you're opting for equal protections for students and independent journalists and their professional peers. With this, you're, I guess you're referring to the clashes that you've had. Um, with the proposed equal protections, the border between the two gets very thin if there remains a, if there remains a, a border at all. With tools such as mobile phones and cameras that, and iPads that everyone has, um, does this mean that everybody who spontaneously makes some newsworthy footage with his cell phone is entitled to these equal protections? Well, I mean, first of all, most videos or, or stories that people are blogging don't need any protections. If you uh, happen to film a street performer on the corner, I mean, in, in this country perhaps there's privacy rights issues, but by and large, most reporting doesn't need protections. Um, but I do think that, you know, we can all be journalists now, and that's absolutely true. But it's not about protecting the journalists, it should be protecting the journalism. Um, if you're uh, working as a journalist, or not working as a journalist and just doing it out of your own volition, I see no reason that you shouldn't be afforded the same protections. Why should a company that's decided to hire you, that's a private company and has no <coughs> greater connections than a random individual, have more rights based on the capital that they've invested in their company? Okay. Um, it is said that uploaded cell phone made footage played a great role in the Arab Spring. How important do you think the internet is in all of this and to what extent could you call the internet a tool of liberation? Well I mean I think it's becoming a bit of a cliche but it used to be that the only people that were part of a free press were the ones rich enough to own a printing press and now anyone can get their message out and certainly when it comes to you know acts of rebellion against uh, a state that's trying to control them, generally speaking, the powers that be, those that have that economic advantage, aren't going to, to stand up to power in the same way that individuals who are struggling in, the, in their day-to-day -day lives and, and don't have that sort of infrastructure of advertising and all these things that they don't want to rock the boat too much, that they are providing the only opportunity to get these sort of stories out there that the media won't touch otherwise. Okay, now it's my colleague, So, in July 2007, you decided to run for mayor of San Francisco. To what extent was this a serious attempt to become a mayor of the city, and what were the main goals of your campaign? So, when I got out of prison, I uh, knew that there was a, an election coming up for, for the mayor of San Francisco where I lived, and I definitely did not want to see the incumbent win, and I also was trying to figure out a way to uh, to define myself as a journalist and I felt that it was important to maintain um, the opportunity to have perspective and so what I wanted to do was I wanted to work on doing some you know video work mm -hmm. for the opposition candidate um, however that candidate never appeared um, and it got to the point that there was no one no viable candidate running for mayor and I'm looking at all these people running and I was at a conference of some sort and someone said you should run for mayor I'm like, that's ridiculous um, and then I like made a blog post and put up a little widget to see if I could raise enough money for the, the filing fee. And money started to come in. It was like, well, I don't think I can win. Um, I don't think anyone running has a chance of beating Gavin Newsom. And that was certainly the, the general perspective. But I felt that I had an opportunity to bring issues forward that otherwise wouldn't be brought to the table um, in many ways is a form of having a voice that, you know, there's this political landscape in a, in, a, in a race. All of these people are basically putting commentary out there, putting suggestions for how things should be run. And I figured that this was a good opportunity to sort of take on sort of a commentary role in the process of running. Um, that doesn't mean that the campaign was a, was a stunt or that I didn't intend to serve office should I somehow have won, but I was well aware that the likelihood of me winning, especially as the money stopped coming in, was highly unlikely. Okay. Thank you. Um, what were the most important 
policies you wanted to introduce as a mayor of San Francisco? Well, it's been a it's been a while since that <laughs> campaign, and um, uh, well, is it maybe related something for to your personal experience as a journalist? Well, I, I can speak of one of my uh, one of my platform items that. Um, was the idea and a sort of campaign promise that I made that if I were elected while working as mayor of San Francisco, while doing the business of the city, I would wear a personal mounted live video camera because all sorts of deals happen behind closed doors and this is the public's business. And I thought that it was a good idea to sort of lead by example that this is a democracy, it's supposed to be a free and open government. Why? Why should we find ourselves in a situation where we don't know what the mayor is doing? The mayor, was, the mayor at the time, who's now the lieutenant governor of California, Gavin Newsom, uh, was rather not the best in terms of transparency and making what he was doing available. And there was a sort of understanding or a suspicion that there was a lot of backroom dealing going on. And I imagine there's a significant amount of backroom dealing in any okay. political office. And I thought that this would be a great way to, to introduce that idea. And a, a corollary to that was I said that our police should also be outfitted with cameras so that what they do is also held accountable. And although I'm yet to hear of a politician that's worn a camera, we have started to see a few police forces wearing mounted cameras. And in fact, the city of Oakland now has cameras on uh, most of their officers. And I made a documentary while at the journalism school about that very program. Did your experiences of what, what happened, spending your time in jail, change your perception about the American system? I would definitely say it changed my perspective. It changed my perspective in a lot of different ways. Um, in the United States, we have this sort of First Amendment that's heralded as like this promise of, of liberty, of freedom, of a free press. And suddenly there was this rude awakening that that illusion was simply that, an illusion. But uh, on a more larger level, the biggest sort of shifts that I saw were, were the experiences I had while in prison. Um, I certainly went into prison a little bit nervous about who I was going to find there and how that sort of interaction between myself and these convicts was going to be. I was a little fearful that I might find myself in, in trouble, as you will. Um, and it, it dawned on me with, with fairly quickly that these are basically good people who found themselves in desperate situations and sought a desperate solution and unfortunately were, you know, ensnared by that and, and found themselves in prison. The other realization was that um, of what, I, what I've coined the 21st, uh, 21st century slave trade. And that is that a good chunk of the people in federal prison are there on the crime of illegal reentry, which means that um, previously they they came from another country without documentation, went to America, were arrested or, or found um, to be undocumented, were deported, and then the second time they come back, there's a ch crime called illegal reentry, which can carry very significant penalties. Usually, uh, it's about two to four years in prison. They're also given a restitution. Um, that works out to somewhere approximately what they make working at 10 cents an hour um, working in the prisons. So basically we have these people that spend two to four years having to do work for the government for 10 cents an hour maybe. That money is then seized back from them in the form of restitution. And unlike the, the, the original slave system that we had in America where you had this situation where s slaves would get old and no longer be, be productive and there was this sort of dilemma that, that, that was around that situation. Well, they, they managed to solve that because if you're too old to work, they could simply just forego that two years and just go straight to deporting them. But basically we have this situation of forced labor of undocumented immigrants whose only crime is crossing an imaginary line. Occupy Washington is coming up in a month. When, what are your hopes for this movement that's going to happen and do you have any plans for it? Um, I mean, I think that the Occupy movement throughout both the country and the world is, is, is important to, to, to watch. We haven't seen anything like this before. Certainly, 
in Oakland where I was doing a lot of filming of, of the Occupy as well as San Francisco I saw a sort of new stage of protest that was quite interesting to see. I haven't been able to, to follow up on what these plans are for the, this next round of Occupy Washington. Obviously there had been an Occupy camp in Washington for quite some time prior to this planned convergence and previously there was an Occupy um, like essentially like a lobbying day where, where people came to Washington to, to speak out of, for the Occupy movement and their concerns. So I see Occupy as a localized movement. I don't really look to what's going to happen in Washington as being indicative of much of anything, honestly. I think that it's far more interesting to watch how local communities are gathering people who are dissatisfied with the world around them and trying to make changes in their communities. Um, I think that making a difference at your local level is a difficult thing to do, but is, is feasible. I think making a difference at the state level becomes much harder, and to make changes at the federal level is such a difficult thing to achieve. And given the system being built to sort of push everything to the center, the idea of making radical changes in a federal government system short of a revolution seems a bit short-sighted. Well, it is a bit philosophical. I mean, the Washington, D.C. is at the heart of basically everything the U.S. is founded on, isn't it? What do you mean? Well, the White House is there, Congress is there, Senate, like everything, everything, the, even the Constitution is in there. It's based in Washington. Oh, okay, scratch that question. I don't know what I was talking about. I mean, I'm sure the Constitution <laughs> is in a library in Washington. Yeah, yeah. It is the, the, U, the U, U.S. capital, but... And there's a history, there's a rich history of marches on Washington and, and this sort of thing. But generally speaking, uh, political change from the bottom up generally happens with targeted campaigns around the actual issues facing them in a direct confrontational manner. Um, the sort of, we had the Million Man March um, several, probably well over a decade ago at this point. Um, and then, of course, there's been many marches before that. And perhaps they've, done a good job of bringing attention to the public because it is Washington you know the national media will, will sometimes focus on that although I'm not sure we're gonna see all that much media attention on Occupy Washington as it comes up but I see this as sort of a symbolic approach and it may be good at getting outreach but that the real battles are fought at the actual level um, that, that they're coming up and that trying to make change through protests in Washington, D.C. at the federal level is only possible through the mobilization of shame and even then it's very limited success and that I'm far more interested in how things are playing out locally. Can you tell me your opinion on Mike, uh, Mayor Bloomberg of New York City, his heavy-handed tactics of suppressing the Wall Street movement at there, especially with some of the arrests of journalists? Um, so the arrest of journalists is an interesting one. Uh, the Reporters Without Borders press freedom index has come up at this conference a few times and the reason that the United States fell to I believe 47th was indicated uh, that it was based around the arrests of journalists during these Occupy protests but it's important to realize that this is the first time there's been anywhere near this amount of militant protest in the United States and so obviously there's going to be more arrests of journalists and when you're dealing with a mass arrest situation and you have really bizarre rules of who gets a press pass and who doesn't and certainly people without press passes are still members of the press it's not uncommon at all for journalists to be ens ensnared in these mass arrests I think I've been arrested three or four times filming protests what what is far more concerned to me isn't the arrest of the journalists it's whether they were released at the point that it was recognized that they were journalists and whether the district attorneys of these locales are going to pursue charges against them. Um, people that shouldn't be arrested, well, probably many of the people at these sort of mass arrests shouldn't be arrested, but people that have no business being arrested, whether they're passers-by or, or journalists, do get ensnared in mass arrests. It's unfortunate. I think targeting of journalists is something that's far more concerning than the police failing to adequately sift through the crowd that was there. Um, there has been some evidence of targeting journalists. Um, certainly 
in past convention pro coverage of protests, there was cases. Amy Goodman was arrested for um, in I think it was the RNC in Minneapolis, and in that case, it was very clear that she and her staff who I think two of them or maybe three of them were arrested were journalists and I think they chose to arrest them because they were journalists um, and that is a real problem um, targeting journalists creates a chilling effect having journalists arrested just through the mass, mass arrest process creates a chilling effect but it's but I have a little more understanding of how this unfortunate situation can happen as opposed to when we actually have the targeting of journalists, such as um, going way back um, when Al Jazeera's uh, offices in Iraq were, were attacked by coalition bombing. Mm -hmm. And although it's unclear whether that was some sort of friendly fire or intentional, it's no secret that the U.S.'s perspective on Al Jazeera at that point in time was that they were essentially a, uh, an agent of the other side, if you will, and since then Hillary Clinton, I believe, has made statements saying that Al Jazeera should be applauded as a, as a news agency, but that definitely was not the perspective at the time that that incident occurred. What is your opinion on the Brandon Manning case? I mean, <clears throat> he, one of the defenses he has is that he wasn't releasing classified information, but rather reporting war crimes. And Obama said that he was guilty of the breaking the law. So that's kind of, it's Basically, since he, he's the commander-in-chief, he's going to be tried in military tribunal. So how can that be a fair trial? As opposed to that there was another case where a sergeant was found guilty of war crimes in Iraq, where he was only downgraded by one rank and he lost some pay. So how, what do you think about the contrast and hypocrisy of it when it comes to reporting it? I mean, I think it's pretty much indisputable that there are soldiers in Iraq that have done far worse and received f far less consequences than Bradley Manning is likely to receive for what was clearly an act of conscience. Um, I think that the comparisons to Daniel Ellsberg are, are, are rather spot on. Um, and at this point in time, Daniel Ellsberg is pretty much universally acclaimed as a hero for helping bring an end to the, the war in Vietnam. Um, I'm a firm believer that far less of what's defined by our government as secret information should be secret. I'm not entirely convinced that anything that's part of the government record should be not available to the public. After all, this is our government. Our tax dollars are the only thing that supports this government. And supposedly, in the United States, it's supposedly a, a democracy, although it's actually a republic. But it's it's a government of the people, by the people, for the people. So why should the people not have a right to know all the stuff that Bradley Manning released to the world? I think it raised a lot of eyebrows about what the U.S. was doing, how things work, and. At the end of the day, I haven't seen any indication that anything that was released through um, the WikiLeaks files has had any negative consequences. There's all sorts of concerns raised about how these people were put in danger and these people were put in danger, and perhaps that was true, or is true, but I haven't seen any indication that that concern has played itself out. And the fact that Bradley Manning is being put through a very non-transparent court process that he's been held in a brig without the same sort of rights to um, exercise, rights to communicate with with his loved ones is completely uh, horrible. It does it goes against the sort of rules about cruel and unusual punishment, and to threaten someone for an information crime that is clearly not espionage and is simply a matter of you know being a whistleblower of sorts with life in prison is not only absurd, it's completely terrifying and it sends a message that the United States is supposedly a leader in a free press and yet the Obama administration has gone after whistleblowers with probably more determination than, than the Bush administration and in reality these people are doing nothing more than opening the world to things that the public should be aware of and I'm not sure that they necessarily should have job security after doing so. I mean, we, we have a country that's very much a sort of, you can be fired for anything, just looking at your boss wrong, you can lose your job. So I'm, I'm a little, little less concerned about their, their job security, but the idea that these people should be put in prison and that the administration should seek um, 
subpoenas to try to track down uh, who talked to a reporter really sends the wrong message about a country that supposedly embraces a free press. In a conversation earlier, you said you used small claims court to help your case. Uh, was I correct in understanding that? Uh, I don't know whether help my case is the right word in retrospect, but there, uh, and that that's pertaining to, to what I went through in, 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 in school. So while I was at UC Berkeley, I found myself ensnared in a situation somewhat similar to my jailing situation, where I filmed a protest on campus um, from, in, from behind a barricaded student building and the, the school threatened to suspend me for it. Um, when I went through my sort of student conduct hearing process, I had a lawyer with me, I had a student conduct advisor, and the code was written pretty explicitly that my advisor should be able to speak on my behalf. Um, this law of Cal uh, the law in the state of California rather implicitly but strongly says that any sort of meetings, any government meetings have to be open to the public, including employment, discrimi er, employment uh, disciplinary hearings. They don't address, you know, students under disciplinary hearings at a public university, but there's no reason that there's a different doctrine that should govern them. So the fact that I was denied the opportunity to have a public hearing and the fact that I was denied the opportunity to have uh, legal representation, both were in play with my federal grand jury subpoena. So that was kind of a rather strange situation to find myself in. And I was advised that the best recourse for this would be to file a small claims court for violation of contract for the professor that was um, refusing to allow me to have a public hearing and an advisor. However, that small claims court wasn't necessarily the best legal maneuver and it wasn't successful and eventually ended up with me saddled with a $900 uh, bill from the university because the university said, no, it's not fit. First off, the university hired a lawyer uh, at a cost of more than $80,000 to uh, defend this professor against this suit that at most would have been $7,500. And that lawyer said, it's not fair for this professor to have to defend himself without the without the ability to have a lawyer because you don't get lawyers in small claims court. So my argument was I needed a lawyer to de I needed the ability to have a lawyer represent me and I sued for that right and his response was you can't sue me in small claims court because I have the right to a lawyer and this isn't fair. And I thought that was a deep irony in the fact that the university has spent tens of thousands of dollars far more than my tuition to fight this bizarre small claims case that was really about raising an issue um, really should bring questions as to who controls the uh, purse strings at the University of California. Well, thank you for your time. I really enjoyed your presentation and thank you for coming too. So. Thank you. Thank you.